Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Declaration International, the leading global organisation defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. There's more information on our website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights, which has been signed by 29,042 people from 157 countries, and is supported by 413 organisations. We have 51 country contacts around the world who are engaged in women's defending women's rights. If you'd like to get involved, have a look at the website, and there's a form there, or you can email. We have changed our name. So we were called Women's Human Rights Campaign, and we have now changed our name to Women's Declaration International. We were launched in March 2019, and Women's Collective Effort to protect our sex-based rights from the harm done by the replacement of the category of sex with that of gender identity. Since March 2019, we've grown into a worldwide grassroots community with 51 country contacts, nearly 30,000 individual signatories from 157 countries. So we have decided to reflect our global reach to change our name to Women's Declaration International. Um, Our goals remain the same, the protection of women and girls' sex-based rights. This week, we have Helen Steele from the UK. She's going to talk to us about the destruction of political movements and the expulsion of feminists from those movements. Uh, The title of her talk is The Use of Safe Spaces Policies to Evict Feminists from Political Organisations. We also have Thistle Pettersson from the USA. She's going to talk to us about the mechanics of being kicked out in Madison, USA. We have Louise Somerville from the UK talking also about environmental organisations uh, pushing out feminists. She'll, she'll tell us uh, more about that. And we have Anne and Alice from China, and they're going to be talking about political lesbianism in China, the real situation of Chinese women, development of political lesbianism among Chinese feminists, and lesbian feminists' understanding of political lesbianism. So I'm really, really uh, happy to welcome our first speaker, Helen Steele. Um, she is going to be speaking on the expulsion of feminists from political movements and the destruction of those movements by gender identity politics, including talking about the so-called safer spaces policies to evict feminists from political organisations and what we can do about it. Helen Steele is an environmental and social justice campaigner since the 1980s and fought a free speech battle in the 1990s after being sued for libel by McDonald's. Then, more recently, after discovering that her former partner had been an undercover policeman, fought a legal battle against the Metropolitan Police with other women who had been similarly used by the police. In 2017, Helen was surrounded by over 30 gender identity activists at the London Anarchist Book Fair after she defended the right of other women to hand out leaflets critical of the proposed reforms to the Gender Recognition Act. Since then, she has also been kicked out of the Man- Manchester Anarchist Book Fair in 2000 and December 2018 and out of the Land Justice Network camp in May 2019. So over to you, Helen. I have um, been a political activist since the 1980s on uh, environmental and social justice issues. Um, I became uh, relatively well known in the 90s because I was sued by the McDonald's Corporation in 1990 over a leaflet which criticised the company um, for the harm that they caused to society and the environment. Um, That led to a massive free speech battle, uh, a court case which lasted over three years and um, actually ended up coming the longest court case in English legal history. We then had a series of um, appeals ending with a a victory in the European Court of Human Rights in 2005. So I have a little knowledge of human rights law uh, and I'm very alarmed that um, so many uh, gender identity proponents and those who call themselves allies don't uphold basic principles of freedom of expression. Um, I've also noticed that um, they use quite a lot of the same tactics as we encountered with McDonald's. 
um, which I think are, are typical of organisations that have a lot of money and power and think that they have the right to control what other people think and say. Um, like McDonald's were complaining that they didn't like um, they didn't like the things that we were saying, but there's a, a failure to recognise that they were saying things and gender identity proponents are saying things that we don't like and we think are harmful, um, but we're not stopping them from speaking. Uh, it's like a one way they seem to think they don't have to listen to what they what they don't like. Um, um, another um, thing that I noticed in common was the strategy of refusing to talk to the media at the same time as us, uh, which then meant that the media would often drop reports because um, the other side weren't there to um, present the kind of balance, as they call it, uh, even though there never seems to be a requirement for balance when um, McDonald's or gender identity advocates are presenting their views. Um, also, through uh, fighting the libel case, I learned about strategic lawsuits in public participation or slap suits. Uh, it's worth people um, looking these up and if they've not heard of them before, which is basically the use of lawsuits to intimidate activists or tie them up in legal proceedings, um, not only to intimidate those who are sued, but also to intimidate observers. Um, and also so that campaigners don't have the time to focus on campaigning, they're busy fighting legal cases. Um, and uh, the use of litigation to shut down free speech has been extensively used by large corporations. And we're also seeing it now with gender identity proponents such as um, Hayden, um, who are bringing court cases repeatedly against um, feminists, to, to try and intimidate and, and silence women. But not only uh, legal proceedings, also we're seeing this tactic being used um, where women are being put through disciplinaries in the workplace, uh, in unions, political parties, and other uh, groups just for expressing opinions on sex and gender. Um, so yeah, that's some of the similarities in, in tactics used. and. Um, uh, when the McLeibel battle was over, I became a, a union rep for Council Gardeners. I was actually working in a, a very male dominated workplace with only three women out of about 90 staff and all male bosses. So I have a <laughs> that was exhausting in itself. Um, and then after that, I took a court case with seven other women against the Metropolitan Police after we found out that our former partners had been undercover policemen who had been infiltrating protest movements. Um, I actually had a two year relationship with an undercover policeman infiltrating London Greenpeace. Um, this ended with an unprecedented apology from the police where they admitted uh, the relationships were serious human rights abuses. So that's kind of a bit of background um, of, of general political stuff. And then I also had some inv in, in involvement in feminist politics, too, which has kind of shaped my thinking. Um, I got involved in political activity about 40 years ago as a 16 year old. Uh, and later that year, I joined, I joined the massive Embrace the Base at Greenham Common, where women surrounded the nuclear base at Greenham in opposition to nuclear weapons. Um, I had limited involvement in the feminist movement of the 1980s, but enough to have experienced a few women only meetings, which actually really changed my outlook both on them and, and on life. Um, initially, I kind of agreed with people, both women and men, who said they thought it was a bit mean to exclude men from the meetings when they were on our side. Uh, but after going to a few women only events, I realised just how different those meetings were to all the political meetings that I'd been to before, which were largely dominated by men's voices. Uh, and it was so interesting to finally get to hear a whole load of women speak about their life experiences, the problems that women face that don't even cross the minds of men because they don't experience them, like periods, the fear, fear of pregnancy, childbirth, and of course, um, being taken for a doormat. Uh, and also to hear of women's priorities and visions for the future. I also briefly went to prison for protesting against pornography. Um, so when I hear of people complaining, men complaining to the police about wanting women arrested for wrong pronouns, it just reminds me of how privileged they are. Um, so, uh, I'd probably better miss a bit of this out because I'm, I'm gonna 
run out of time. Um, so I had been to some feminist events, then I got tied up in McLeibel and that kind of became my focus for a long time. And then uh, in 2014, um, I was quite excited to see flyers for an anarcho-feminist uh, conference that I assumed was a, a women-only event. I think the last one I'd been to was about 1987 or something like that, which had been absolutely brilliant. Um, but a friend who I was with expressed concern about what they'd read from the organisers. Uh, and when I looked online and saw statements declaring basically that males were welcome if they identified as women, um, and that there was a, a safer spaces policy um, that basically demanded control of women's thinking and threatened um, re-education for any woman who didn't comply, um, I was no longer enthusiastic about it and I decided not to go. Um, but then the day before, uh, a couple of friends pleaded with me to go um, and I looked through the programme again and I saw a session headed What is Gender, which was apparently um, going to be led by trans people. Um, and as uh, whenever I tried to discuss the issue of sex and gender with friends, I'd been told I needed to listen to more trans voices. I thought this would be a good opportunity to try and understand what to me seemed to be a load of sexist nonsense. Um, so I went to this session and um, it was a space for about 20 or 30 people and it was rammed with about 80 people. Uh, predictably enough, the session was led by a man with a beard who declared that his pronouns were she and he was accompanied by a woman who declared she identified as they. Uh, and despite their declared identities, their roles in the meeting largely conformed to the um, stereotypes for their sex. He was dominant, she was supporting. Um, also, predictably enough, they completely failed to explain what gender was. Uh, and instead told everyone um, to get into small groups to discuss what we all thought gender was. Um, in my group, the first woman to speak was told off for, for kind of like wrong think um, by a, one of the re-educators in our group. And then after that, most of the people were then reluctant to say much because they were all worried about getting told off too. Uh, after that, at the end of that, there was a like a feedback session. And once the feedback was done, um, well, actually, I should say that the dominant feedback seemed to be that most people there didn't know what um, gender was. And my impression at the time was mostly that they were too afraid to say what they thought, although given the uh, incoherence of gender identity politics, it may just be that they really didn't know. Um, then the session kind of degenerated into a round of men uh, complaining about women wanting women, women only spaces and how that made them feel unsafe. Uh, I put up my hand I wasn't invited to speak until right at the end of the meeting, by which time I was extremely nervous. I explained the importance of women only spaces and that women were um, socialized to be less confident and forthright than men, that men tended to dominate political meetings. And that for me, women only spaces had enabled me to find my voice uh, and to be able to speak in front of other people. I noted that the conference had sessions designated for trans women only, for women of colour only, and I asked why there were no women, I didn't know the language then, women born women uh, <laughs> sessions only. And um, at that point, the meeting just kind of erupted and uh, all these men got up and stormed out. Um, I was just kind of aware of all these skirts swishing by me. And um, basically it was in flagrant disregard of the safer spaces policy that said, um, that people, attendees should listen to the, the perspectives of people who had different life experiences to theirs. And then after they'd all left, uh, the man with the beard that was running the session who identified as a she, then told me I needed to reflect on how, how I had made those feel, people feel so unsafe that they had to leave the session. Um, this really was kind of my moment where I just, I, I really, all the remaining doubts that I had were washed about, about washed away about whether I might have misunderstood the nature of gender identity politics. Um, and it was totally clear that they were really sexist and the same old expectation that women be quiet and listen to men. Um, so uh, 
in I became aware in 2017 of the proposals to reform the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, I was actually at Speaker's Corner when um, Maria McLaughlin was assaulted. Uh, and um, obviously that was quite a shocking moment, um, you know, to see the to see the uh, extent that um, these gender identity proponents were prepared to go to 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 silence women. Um, about a month after that was the London Anarchist Book Fair, which is a, an event that's been running for um, over 20 years. Um, and um, I was actually speaking at that event um, uh, about uh, land justice issues, which I was involved with. Um, and I, after that meeting, I was just chatting to a friend uh, and I overheard um, some people coming and complaining about leaflets that were being handed out uh, by women. Uh, they were saying that they were transphobic. They, uh, there, there was a thing that I'd never heard before at the time. This woman said, "They're saying that women can. They're, they're saying that women can't have penises." So I, it like blew my head at the time. I was just like, "What? You're complaining about that?" Um, and uh, anyway, then uh, about ten minutes after that, I heard this great kerfuffle. And um, I went over to where the kerfuffle was and there were a couple of women that were totally surrounded by trans activists um, who were uh, like taking things out of their bags and um, just shouting in their faces and being quite intimidation. Uh, so I, um, I actually lived near there at the time and I helped them um, leave because one of them was very keen to leave because it was so intimidating. When I came back into the venue, all of a sudden I was surrounded um, and some of the people that were in the crowd surrounding me um, were, were uh, some of the people who'd been at Speaker's Corner. And um, anyway, I was surrounded for around about uh, over an hour, which was quite an, ex well, it was an extremely intimidating experience. Um, I wrote about it afterwards and uh, that's available on, um, WordPress I've got it's not really there's not really much on there but I've got a little WordPress section um, then um, there was a, a massive fallout after the anarchist book fair as a result of this uh, and the proper anarchist book fair has not been held ever since because gender identity proponents were demanding control over um, how it was run and um, that they had to adopt all sorts of so-called safer spaces policy and exclude women like me uh, who don't meet with their pre-approved views. Um, then, um, sorry, I'm losing my thread. <laughs> uh, about a year, about a year after that, I um, was asked to leaflet the Manchester Anarchist Book Fair, and I um, I helped hand out leaflets there. Uh, we were again told that we had to leave um, we were trying to persuade them to talk to us saying that it was completely incompatible with anarchist principles to exclude women from participating in discussions about what the word woman means and whether uh, males should be allowed into women only spaces but they wouldn't listen and I was physically carried out of the venue um, and then the, the the other side the main thing that I wanted to talk about I'm sorry I'm maybe taking too long um, was that it, um, I was involved with the Land Justice Network. And uh, in November, 2016, I'd attended this Land for What conference. Um, and um, I'd actually suggested that we should have a day of action on land issues. I um, was part of setting up a land justice action group. Um, and in the aftermath of the Anarchist Book Fair, uh, people in that group were quite sympathetic, empathetic towards me about what happened, which obviously they'd heard of. But then a few weeks later, uh, one of the men said that um, he had friends who wanted to get involved with an action that we were going to be organising. Um, but they, in order for them to get in, involved, they, uh, we needed to pass a safer spaces policy because otherwise they didn't feel safe getting involved. And given my experiences of uh, safer spaces policies, I actually um, was quite alarmed to hear this and I could kind of see where it was going to go. So 
I uh, suggested firstly that we couldn't really discuss it until there was a concrete proposal that we could look at and then when he well initially I hoped that might be the end of it but he actually came back with a proposal a few weeks later and uh, the first obvious thing about it was that while it listed transphobia it didn't mention sexism um, but it also called on everyone involved to call out any kind of transgressive behaviour. Now I actually spoke against this at the meeting and it wasn't passed. Uh, I explained that um, it was actually be these kind of policies were being used to shut down women and prevent women from talking about um, the effect of sexism on our lives and how our experiences differ from those of men. Um, and as I say, they didn't pass it. The action went ahead and that was all fine. However, I then moved out of London and was no longer involved with the group. And they then, when I wasn't there, they had another bite at the cherry and um, passed this safer spaces policy. And so when I went up to um, the land justice protest camp in May 2019, um, I was actually aware that they had a safer spaces policy, but I, I saw that it included sexism this time. Um, so I decided it would be okay to attend as I had no, no intention of raising gender identity politics um, unless it was in response to somebody else raising them, uh, in which case I could like invoke the rule against sexism to point out why I was opposing gender identity politics. Um, I helped with setting up the camp on the first day, then I attended discussions on the second day. Um, Many of my old friends in the action group were there and none of them said anything to me to make me feel I wasn't welcome. But on the second day, a, a woman who I didn't know approached me while I was standing at the back of the meeting and asked if I was Helen. And when I said yes, she said, well, it's a shame you're here because now it's not safe for trans people to be here. Uh, and I said, you know, I said, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but uh, right now I'm listening to this meeting, so I'll talk to you afterwards if you want. She didn't attempt to talk to me afterwards. Uh, on the third day, we set off for a walk across the moors. Um, and while we were on the moors, I was then told that I wasn't welcome and I had to leave. Uh, and she was the instigator of that. But um, when I, I kind of challenged them and then one of the people who had been my old friends uh, and who I'd worked with turned around and said, no, we've made a decision that you've got to leave. Uh, because you've been transphobic and um, I said well I haven't actually said anything here um, and uh, then I was just told well they've made a prior decision um, at which point um, a couple of people who were involved in the organizing group said well they didn't know anything about it and obviously decision had been made by a clique so this this safer spaces policy then I had I've kind of I've just seen it now several times used to basically against women and um, to, 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 to stop women from being involved with groups, to split groups. Um, and what I noticed was the guy who introduced this safer spaces policy to, to the group that I was in, when he told his friends about the fact that he knew me, what seems to happen is they then get told, oh, you've got to, you've got to like, you know, confront that person in that group, get rid of them from that group. And the, the document, the uh, resisting TERFs and transforming their organisations. Now, this was actually only passed. Um, uh, this was only published in May 2020. And um, it's got extensive details, basically, of how to take over any organisations which are um, which which have women who as part of them who are vocal against gender identity politics um, and I when I read that I recognized so many of the tactics that had been used against me and other women in political campaigns in this country um, and I think it's a really important document to become familiar with to see how they work and one of the key things that I wanted to say was about the fact that as soon as you see the introduction of the safer spaces policy into any group that you are part of, make sure that you tackle it at that point. Um, because once it's been passed, the expectation is that everybody who is part of that group is responsible for 
implementing that policy. And so rather than it being the trans activists who tell you um, that you've got to leave and who would be seen to be creating the division through doing that, they make everybody responsible and therefore it doesn't seem like it's them that's causing division. It seems like it's the person who's objecting to being kicked out who is causing the division. Um, so that's why it's important to kind of tackle those policies before, before they um, get a hold. Another thing that I wanted to mention was about an organisation called Campaign Bootcamp, which actually did a lot of really amazing work uh, in training activists in how to campaign effectively. Um, things like picking a goal, thinking who or what you're campaigning about, your aims, short term and long term and so on. But what they also did was train people in gender identity politics uh, and calling for active allyship. Um, if you went to their training, you were expected to use preferred pronouns and, and all that sort of thing. And the idea behind this training was that you then took that, the training that they'd given you, you took, took it back to your group. And so it all spread like that. And so that was how a large part of how uh, gender identity proponents managed to basically infiltrate the whole of the, the social justice movements and the environmental movements and get their politics to take such a strong hold before anyone really realised what was going on. Um, and, um, you know, then the upshot of that is that we've seen uh, women being kicked out of all those organisations. I'm kind of aware that uh, a lot of what we said was a bit negative, um, uh, but I hope that it does mean that, or, or it may mean that if women around the world uh, start to see these things happening in their groups that, um, you know, they can nip them in the bud before they take hold. So hopefully, uh, despite it being negative, it is worthwhile because I think so many of us didn't actually realise the nature of what we were up against until it had already um, gained a, a really strong hold on, on the movements that we were part of. Um, I was thinking, I think we need to restart uh, women only environmental anarchist and other political groups. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to my memories of Greenham and other, uh, you know, I don't know, in the 80s, we also occupied uh, a women's hospital that was going to be closed. So lots of different, um, you know, women only actions that could be um, organised um, to, to show uh, how powerful women only organising can be, uh, especially for younger women who may never have experienced um, genuine women only spaces. The positive side of this battle uh, against gender identity ideology, which is generally pretty uh, not positive, uh, is, is actually meeting a whole bunch of fantastic feminists and um, I've really enjoyed the huge number of feminist meetings I've been to since 2017. It really has been mind expanding and inspirational, uh, not least these meetings as well. Um, the final thing that I wanted to mention is that um, I think the consequences of bullying by trans activists can really have um, a det detrimental impact on women's mental well-being. Uh, so it's really important that we um, kind of exercise self-care and solidarity uh, amongst ourselves and other women. Um, if we want our politics to be sustainable, we need to think about how we go about things. Um, all of us come with different life experiences, so conflict will be inevitable. Um, but how we deal with the conflict can make or break an organisation um, so I think like being conscious that many women actually feel exhausted by the tax by trans activists. So really try and avoid <laughs> attacks within the movement. Um, and I think in cases of conflict, uh, it's good to try and assume good motives rather than the worst motives and trying to talk through our differences and checking out whether there's been a misunderstanding rather than making denunciations is a, is a good way to go. And finally kind of looking after ourselves and others that we work with um, in the past I've been involved in kind of like activist trauma groups and key key messages that we learned through our discussions then were about um, phoning friends who've gone quiet to check that they're okay um, and also meeting up socially not just for political events but socially so you can all relax together and get to know each other 
um, you know, going for a meal or something like that. And also the importance of uh, both exercise and nature, uh, which are really good for mental health. So doing things like organising, uh, you know, a walk in your local park or um, or in the countryside with with other women, just so you've got a chance to kind of, um, yeah, relax, but discuss things in a non-intense way and kind of talk through what you're feeling because it is quite an intense battle. We're going to move on now to Thistle. So Thistle Patterson is from the USA. Um, she's going to speak about the many ways in which Madison activist organisations, a radio station, music venues and her peers in the Madison community kicked her out due to feminist views of transgenderism and gender ideology. So thank you so much for coming, Thistle, and um, over to you. It's really great to be here uh, so that I can talk about my experiences with being kicked out of organizations, a neighborhood center, and music venues due to publicly expressing gender critical and feminist views in my community in Madison, Wisconsin. I love you women very much and give my life to the cause of women's freedom. So how did it all happen? The mechanics or the causes and dynamics of me being kicked out and shunned by organizations and peers alike were fueled by the lie that I am a violent threat to people who identify as trans. This lie was generated by a mob of trans activists and it spread like a social virus in my community, which in turn started the shunning and the banning. All of it started back in 2012 when I tried to hold a workshop on feminism at the Anarchist Book Fair in the Twin Cities, but it was canceled due to transphobia, a term that I had never heard before. I was attacked on the Book Fair's Facebook event page by a huge mob. Somebody threatened to th break my guitar and land me in the hospital. And I was astounded that this was tolerated and supported by the Anarchist Book Fair organizers. I contacted Sheila Jeffries to consult with her and let her know what had happened to me. And I asked her for an interview two years later when her book, Gender Hurts, came out. I applied to do an access hour show and then went on community radio station WORT 89.9 FM in Madison. I had permission from the access hour producer and the news director to do this show and I was no stranger to the radio station. Having grown up in Madison, I volunteered there regularly answering phones during their pledge drives and volunteering at benefit concerts to raise money for WORT. And also I went on the air quite regularly to make announcements about my environmentalist activist projects and my music projects. I did the program with Jeffries with goodwill and, and curiosity and an intention to have public dialogue about gender. Well, dialogue is what they had because before and after my one hour show was aired, the WORT community produced multiple shows, reports, and statements about my single one-hour program with Jeffries. The local newspaper even had an article about my show with Jeffries calling her a controversial feminist known for her negative portrayal of transgender people. This was all in 2014. And this article in the paper and all of those wart statements, reports, and shows were meant to marginalize and cut down my single one-hour program. I was called a hateful bigot for the first time during this period in 2014, and it infuriated me. But what infuriated me more was that regular people, people I considered ethical and friends of mine, left me in the dust. Didn't they realize that by silencing me, they were silencing themselves too by submitting to the forceful will of the gender activists? I was the example of what would happen to them if they spoke out, but it was by their complicity that they made me into that example. And I stood in disbelief as my social, political, and artistic world crumbled around me. Having said that, there were, a significant, there were significant numbers of others who wrote to the station in support of Sheila, me, and the show. I came to count on this support in Madison more than once. Flashing forward to 2019, I had nine, supported, nine supporters willing to show their faces and speak at the Wilmar Neighborhood Center's board meeting in protest of their ban on me there. It should be noted that the board of directors at the Wilmar ignored these nine supporters. 
But getting back to 2014 and 15, it was with this support and fortitude and some good social skills that I managed to recover from the backlash of doing feminist radio shows on WORT. A local theater friend circulated a petition at the Crystal Corner Bar for me to get a show there and she was successful. The reason the petition was necessary was due to the backlash. Everyone knew about the radio shows and there is a lot of overlap in the Madison community between WORT, the Wilmar Neighborhood Center and the Crystal. Thanks to the petition and the will of the regulars at the bar, I enjoyed playing a monthly show with my band at the Crystal Corner Bar throughout 2016. So this is a picture of the marquee in front of the bar. And as you can see, I, my act was one of three regular shows. Of note, the two others were boy bands, all, all males in, in, in those acts. And I was the only female act part, uh, playing at the bar on a regular basis. And um, David Hecht, his name is up there, he sits on the board or he used to sit on the board at the Wilmar Neighborhood Center. One of the bartenders at the Crystal Corner Bar is a major volunteer at WORT. So it's all in a neighborhood and the bar is in the arts district in Madison. So if you wanna be an artist or a musician or an actor, you go and you mix and mingle with people at this bar and others in this neighborhood. So I just wanted to give you a little context of um, what it was like at the Crystal Corner Bar for me. Getting the show at the Crystal after I had been banned and defamed at the community radio station led me to falsely believe that I could separate my music career and presence on the music scene in Madison from my feminist stance. I believed in, I believed in, and in one-on-one -on -one conversations with many people, I experienced understanding, dialogue, warmth, and a willingness to tolerate differing views. I still believe that the majority of people fall into this camp, but that they are bullied into silence and apathy, believing that if they just stay silent, the problem will be minimalized or even just fade away and never impact them. My social recovery in Madison was cut short in early 2017 after January, the January 20th Women's March where I held up this sign. Um, this sign actually was sent around the world. Kathy Brennan initiated a sister, uh, a sisterhood solidarity act and dozens of women around the world after they saw what happened to me for holding up this sign, held it up and, and pictures were taken of them and they were shared on a website that unfortunately was taken down and I don't have access to those pictures anymore. So anyway, after holding up this sign, um, starting in February of 2017, an all out campaign to destroy my music career ensued. This campaign was begun and sanctioned by the Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice, an umbrella organization in Wisconsin that was founded in 1991 to oppose the Iraq war and the violence of wars in general. So they have since added the, the term sustainability to their name, but everyone still knows them as WMPJ. By 2017, WMPJ was home to hundreds of peace and justice organizations, including one that I co-founded called Madison Action for Mining Alternatives, or MAMA, an environmentalist org that fought frac sands mining, pipelines, and the Pinocchio Hills iron mine. It was with MAMA that I was organizing the Pipeline Fighters Benefit Extravaganza, an event that took the better part of a year to plan. The TRAs in the last week leading up to this event convinced my co-organizers to cancel my musical performance from the lineup. Here is WMPJ's statement that they published on February 3rd, 2017, and kept up for three years after that, despite many pleas from me and others that they take it down. And I realize it's a little difficult to read. So but in a nutshell, basically it says that um, I, Thistle Patterson, am causing harm to trans people in Madison and that I was publishing hate statements online against trans people and that these hate statements uh, lead to violence against trans people and suicides and that I have no place in Madison. An AGP male in Madison felt em emboldened by, the, by WMPJ's February 3rd statement and launched a campaign to get me fired as a, regular for, as a regular musician at the Crystal Corner Bar. 
And um, here's a pic of that lovely human named Christine Elaine. Um, he had dozens, maybe even hundreds of pics like this one up on his social media at the time. He fronted a band in 2018 called Dumpster Dick that featured a song about burning turfs in a dumpster. And here, the next slide is um, a picture of a Facebook event page that he and others used to get people to sign up to come to my performance to disrupt it in protest of me having a show there. Um, it's interesting to note that it took some convincing because it took some convincing for me to get the show at the Crystal Corner Bar and um, it took some convincing for them to take it away as well. But once they were convinced, then I, there was no going back. I never was able to play there again. Little by little, old friends became worried about what this shunning would do to them and their reputations and I lost many friendships. By 2022, my reputation as an environmental activist variety show organizer and musician has basically been ruined. Over the past five years, starting in 2017, I have been barred from participating in the regular day-to-day, month-to-month, and year-to-year -year functioning of live music and cultural events in my city, something I had a regular hand in organizing and participating in for years before that. Let me pause to say that a main reason trans activists target me is because I never back down. And in fact, when I was temporarily banned from the community radio station due to complaints from TRAs, I decided to start my own community radio station online and WLRN was born in 2016. The TRAs hate that I am not alone in my views and that our collective of media activist women produces a monthly feminist radio show and that we have not missed one month since May of 2016. I wanna just say hello briefly and shout out to my sisters, April Null, Emily Ann Lorenzen, Aurora Linnea, Sekhmet Shiaul, and Jenna DeQuarto at the station. As you can see from the WMPJ statement and Christine Elaine's campaign, they basically say that I have no place in Madison, but I don't give up easily and I am committed to staying here to continue fighting the good fight to be a citizen again in my city and a musician, which brings me to something I want to announce. And that is that during the winter of 2020 and 21, when we were all on lockdown, I was able to work with an old friend in his basement studio to create this new album of music. It's interesting to note that this old friend is a regular volunteer at the community radio station and that he represents a Madison that I hope will come to accept me again as a musician in town. Being canceled has led people like this WORT volunteer to be curious and also compassionate about what has happened to me. In fact, it was a WART staff member who wishes to remain anonymous who came to my apartment in early 2016 to help, help me set up my dining room to be a studio for WLRN. I point this out because even though the TRAs like to make it seem like I am alone, I would not have been able to co-create WLRN, nor would I have been able to release my new album of original music if it weren't for locals in Madison who have supported me. And you can find that album of music at thistlepetterson.com, just for your information. But now getting back to the Pipeline Fighters Benefit Extravaganza held in early 2017. As you can see, there was a lot that went into this event. The WMPJ February 3rd defaming statement released just one day before this event was definitely a huge part of the mechanics of how TRAs damaged not just me, but our environmental movement. They did not need to publish that statement. I had already agreed not to perform at the event. So the only purpose of the statement was to spread the lie that I was hateful and causing violence in Madison and to scare and intimidate individuals and environmental organizations away from associating with me. I attended the February 4th event in defiance. I had organized the silent auction, booked all of the acts in the lineup and had secured the sponsoring orgs and logos. For this reason, and because my cancellation was so fresh and so shocking, I went to the event I had organized and stayed till the very end for the funk band that I had booked and I danced with everyone until the close. The TRAs who had complained the loudest and the most about me were not even there. 
It was so ridiculous that I was barred from performing at the very event that I had helped organize. And this is how I feel what happened to me has had a lasting harmful impact on the environmental movement in Madison as well. MAMA, the Madison Action for Mining Alternatives, fell apart shortly after the benefit with a longtime member saying she would no longer participate if I was involved. So we decided to dissolve, dissolve the organization. The other environmental orgs that were there um, were threatened, that were threatened, sorry. The other environmental organizations that were threatened by the TRAs with being labeled transphobic have also not been the same ever since I was canceled in this way by the WNPJ. Of note, two of the five organizers on the team creating the Pipeline Fighters Benefit Extravaganza have since publicly regretted their decision to pressure me to not play my music at the event. One of them even wrote a letter to the Wilmar Neighborhood Center that he allowed Defend Feminists to publish on their website. In that letter, he writes, quote, that night when I found it easier to give in to mob demands two years ago will haunt me to my grave. I would not want you to fall into the trap of what seems easier in the flush of a moment of contention when the path down the road to mob pressure ends in rupturing everything we all hold dear in a fair and democratic society. And by the way, defendfeminists.net is a website that members of FIST created to help me document and fight what has happened to me. Their website is defendfeminists.net if you want to explore the nitty gritty details of all that has happened. Shame on Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice. Shame on the Wilmar Neighborhood Center and the Crystal Corner Bar. Good on WORT 89.9 FM for lifting the ban on me in 2016 and for airing all of my feminist access hour programs I have applied to do. WORT is the lone institution in Madison that I've been involved with that continues to have a strong contingent of people in favor of free speech, despite most, most at the station being captured by the trans cult. And finally, it's so freeing to share my story with all of you today. Come to Madison, my hometown in Wisconsin, this spring on April 23rd for a WLRN public library panel discussion called Courage Calls to Courage, featuring the speakers you see pictured here. This event was initiated by Lierre Keith after hearing about the disorderly conduct with a hate crime enhancement citation I received from the, the Madison police for allegedly putting up a feminist sticker on State Street last summer. Let's show Madison that we are not alone, that turfs take back the town square. There will also be a women only weekend of fun and solidarity with direct action and musical performances that you can participate in. The event in Madison at the public library is in person. So please don't get a ticket to, to the event unless you're gonna be in Madison. There are only 175 available and they're free. Um, but you need to be able to come physically to Madison. Also, I wanted to announce that there's going to be a critical mass bike, round, bike ride on Friday evening for the Sisters for, Sister, Sisters for Sisters event. So sign up for that weekend and come to Madison. It's going to be called Turf Traffic. And we're going to take the streets on our bicycles. Um, we have so many fun things planned for the weekend. Uh, I really hope that all of you can make it. So um, I'm really looking forward to just taking over the town. And we've got lots of plans for how to do that symbolically and physically to just be there and have a presence in the town like, like never before. So um, I hope you all can make it to Madison for the public library event and for the Sisters for Sisters event. And I, I think that's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here to tell my story. It was, it, it's hard, it's so hard. I, I'm, I might, I'll probably cry a lot after this. My stomach hurts. Um, what Helen was just saying is so true. It's been, it's so hard, um, but we have to do it. We have to stand up, we have to, 
take back the town square. I mean, women are human beings. We're people. We have the right to, to be in public without being harassed and to participate in, in all of these organizations and all of these movements um, without, you, you know, it's harming our environmental movement to this gender identity ideology stuff. It's, it's harming everything. And so come out, come out wherever you are and let's st stand strong together in solidarity. Thank you again for having me on Feminist Question Time. It is a real honor to be here. Thank you so much. We're now gonna move uh, to Louise Somerville um, to hear her story. So Louise is from the UK. She's gonna uh, talk to us about being evicted from environmental organizations. She's been an environmental campaigner since the year 2000. She told me that being part of making a difference is what gets her up in the morning especially now her youngest child is able to make his own breakfast so um thank you so much louise for coming on and um it will be great to hear your story so over to you i felt that it was important to speak out on what happened to me when joe got in touch and i wanted to share that i haven't actually told this story before and it does make me feel immensely nervous. What I have done is watch as woman after woman after woman has been kicked out of work, of online spaces, of organizing groups. And it's absolutely broken my heart to see women who have been removed from their jobs, losing their income. And I can completely understand why women don't speak out when there are huge risks that happen. And at the same time, I do get that some of us absolutely have to, and that it's a space that we each need to find within ourselves. I just felt I wanted to say that. I didn't actually realize when I spoke out what was going on. I didn't understand that I would be summarily dismissed from the spaces that I was organizing in. So I felt it was important to tell you a little bit about those spaces. Um, what's quite interesting is I appear to have lost them from my notes. So I do need to remember what it is that I've done. Um, so I started in, I think about 1999 and I began organizing against genetically engineered crops, which were being planted in test sites across the United Kingdom. And I organised in the southwest of England, which is where I'm from, and there were crops due to be planted in Dorset. So I began the campaign in Dorset and I arranged with other people to do rallies, to do meetings. And I've always been a very active organiser. Um, there are no GM crops being planted commercially in the United Kingdom, and that's because a group of really dedicated people, men and women, conspired and acted and moved to stop that happening. I then found my attention being taken by an incinerator that was being built nearby. So I started a campaign against that and, and won. There is no incinerator near me. At this point, my children said, mummy, we want you back. So I took a break for a couple of years and then I heard about fracking and I became really passionate and I spent over five years in the anti-fracking movement. I interspersed that with some moments campaigning against burying, burying radioactive waste in a hole in the ground because the British government decided that that was a really good idea. Although they didn't quite call it burying radioactive waste in a hole in the ground. And I moved on and I moved forward. I worked for Biofuel Watch. I campaigned on bioenergy. I campaigned against coal. And um, <clears throat> I've just basically spent the last 17 years in environmental activism. And... Then I heard about Helen Steele at the Anarchist Book Fair through my colleagues, my environmental activist colleagues. And I heard about it from a woman who was a co-founder of the campaign group I had helped to organise, Frack Free Somerset. And she put something on social media about how dreadful what had happened at the Anarchist Book Fair was. And I went, Helen Steele? but she's Britain's most celebrated female activist, but she's great. Ah, what's, what's going on? What's happening? Completely and utterly stunned that a woman of such calibre, a woman that was so distinguished for her work, 
was being so defamed. So I began to look into what was happening. I discovered gender critical feminism. I had no previous experience, knowledge, awareness of, or even interest in women's rights or feminism before the anarchist book fair and before what happened to Helen caught my eye. And of course the other women who were also present at the, at the anarchist book fair. So I began to post on Facebook and then the avalanche began. The disagreement, the hurtful comments, the wounding insults. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. And then I received a message from two anti-fracking um, sisters. They sent me some screenshots. I, so I've forgotten, I did a couple of pictures. That's a group that I forgot to mention actually, and it is worthy of mentioning at this point. That's uh, the back of the anti-fracking nanas. I decided I didn't want to show the women's faces. Um, and it's an important one to remember because it's the only all female environmental campaign group in the United Kingdom. So I felt that the anti-fracking nanas needed to be mentioned. And I do have a yellow tabard and a yellow headscarf upstairs. So this is the screenshot that was sent to me. And it's a picture of me taken outside a venue in Bristol called the Jam Jar in the southwest of England. And I was just completely shocked, completely and utterly shocked. Um, I was shocked that I was being accused of making transphobic statements. And actually, those statements aren't necessarily quite true. But then when the conversation continued and uh, there was a reason that for some reason I shouldn't be in favour of the Nordic model and uh, that really got me. But the language really disturbed me and it's still disturbing me now because I've never shared this with anybody. This is the first time I've, I've ever talked about it and I don't really want to look at those anymore but you can't quite see the final comment because of the like. And that like and the wall that those comments were pasted on was from a woman with whom I have over 200 mutual friends. And I couldn't believe that anybody, particularly women, could treat another woman this way. And when I discussed this with a friend earlier, we talked about how women can be the strongest and fiercest enforcers of bullying and handmaidens and how all the men need to do is say well trans women are women and uh, and they can move on and keep their nice left-wing reputations intact so the conversation continued about how to take other activists out and then when i saw i mean dying a fire was 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 a shock i did find it challenging but i was still feeling resilient at this point and I didn't actually recognize the level of vitriol and harm and exclusion that would occur um and then I saw if I go anywhere and I spot Louise I'll request that she be booted out drain the swamp that statement was said by somebody that I had driven to Barton Moss anti-fracking camp in the north of England we'd been in a car for over four hours he'd come back to my home and shared food with me. I had fed him. Like these are people that I have organized closely with for years and years and I still struggle to understand how people can behave in such an unpleasant way. At the time I was running eight environmental campaigns, social media accounts, and I just thought this is just going to blow over. These, these are horrible people and they're being unpleasant to me. We were friends, I'm finding it wounding, but it'll be fine, it'll be fine. I could just carry on. And then I went to post something on the Earth First Collective Facebook page. And it was gone. And I'm like, but I've organized workshops at Earth First. I go to their gatherings every year. What's happening? So I sent a message to a friend who didn't know. So then I went and posted it on Reclaim the Power, which is a was a pretty large environmental protest group. And I was some I wasn't there anymore either. So I got a bit of a shock. The only campaign group who engaged in any explanatory dialogue was Coal Action Network. And 
I'm really grateful for that. And the message was kind and it was thoughtful, but it did say that they organise with trans people and therefore I was no longer suitable to be part of their organising team. I still didn't take that much notice. I was absolutely convinced that my fellow activists would see the truth of biological reality, recognise women's oppression. And it didn't happen. And then the campaign I was most active in was impacted. And then it hurt. Then I really felt wounded. Frack Free Somerset was the only active anti-fracking group in the southwest of England at the time because we were the only area with licenses for fracking. And I would organise minibuses. Um, a close friend of mine, Andy and I would meet each week. We would take minibuses all around the country. We'd go to front lines. We would stand beside people that were living at frack sites. We would do petitions and we used to organise events called Frack Free February. And for four years, we managed to get between 25 and 30 events happening just in the month of February. We were really busy, busy people. So I organised a minibus to go to the north of England and I went to the Frack Free Bristol organising group, which for those of you from who are international women is the next town to me also in the southwest of England but no go, completely blocked. So I tried again the next day. I wasn't really believing that this excommunication was actually happening. I was still thinking, it'll blow over. It'll all be fine. But it didn't blow over and it wasn't fine. And that group and that page that I was involved in, I managed to get back in because I'm quite technically competent and I'm not going to say how I did that because then I'm going to give my secrets away, which would not be good you can ask me if you like and I went and checked the group and the person that had thrown me out was the same person that said kick Louise out of any organizing spaces this is somebody who'd never ever posted in the group or done anything at all and then one by one cold shoulders hard stares total and utter excommunication from a movement that I had been actively part of for 17 years People that I had stood beside on front lines, in protests, on marches, on rallies, just gone, completely gone. And I built my life on environmental activism. It was what I did. You know, as, as Joe said, it's what got me out of bed in the morning. And then I discovered feminism and what a lovely, welcoming group you are. And you're absolutely right, Joe. we will continue. We absolutely will. What has really got to me is the wholesale co-option of the ideology everywhere. And Helen mentioned Campaign Bootcamp. I won an environmental scholarship award to Campaign Bootcamp a few years ago, and I've worked for them twice. And that was the first time that I had actually come across transgender, gender identity ideology. And I just believed it, and I did it too, which, takes me to where other women might be and how aware that we need to be sometimes when people are not familiar with the topics which we discuss through Women's Declaration International and other feminist groups that we're involved in, is that there are still people that don't understand. There are still people being kind and being nice. They don't know about the witch hunt. They don't realise just how hard it is. And I I didn't know when I was at campaign boot camp. I just didn't understand. I asked questions. That didn't really work. And so feminism has been redefined. It, it, it doesn't actually count as feminism in the environmental movement. It only counts as feminism to us because feminism, according to some, now includes men. Not my feminism, not your feminism. And that's not where we're going forward. This is really out of order. This lady's disabled if you hurt her. Well, it's good for the hurt people. That's majorly unbelievable. I've never had to climb over people to get into a building before to discuss women's rights. And it is totally unacceptable. I don't know what you've got.
guys are wrong, but we're here to talk about women's rights. And that's what matters to us. That meeting was organised by Venice Allen who had a group, uh, what I'm talking about, was it called It's Time to Talk? And Venice organised the very first public meetings on gender identity ideology. That particular meeting happened on a warm spring evening in Bristol, and it was held at a community venue. Um, there was a panel of four people and as we approached the building, the front entrance was completely blockaded by people, I don't like, I'm not going to call them activists actually, um, horrible people who held massive banners out in front of the building and they mostly wore bandanas and they were covered from the nose down and it was, it was pretty intimidating. So in order to get into the building, me and my friend that also went up the stairs there lifted this, um, lifted the banner. And they said, you can't go up. The police are in there. You can't go in. The police are in there. And I was like, and my friend, she was, she's really gutsy. Actually, she was like, you just try and stop us. So we got onto the bottom of the stairs and each rung of the stairs had a trans activist in a bandana. You know, are they called bandanas? Yeah, those masks that cover them. And, and, and hats on. So all you could see were these eyes. You had no idea what sex anybody was. Um, my friend marched through the middle of them and I climbed up this piece of wood that was at the bottom of the banisters. So I had this like little gap of wood about this big. And then I pulled myself up using the handle on the stairs. And then I got into the room and I just couldn't believe it. And I thought, they're children. They're the same age as much. They could be younger than two of my children, and I'm simply not having so, it. One little point, you'll see yeah. that the, the back head of a woman is in that video at the top of the stairs holding a mobile phone. I just want to say that that's Magdalene Burns. Have faith that we can win. Have faith that our actions together will make a huge difference. Because we can make a difference we are already making a difference and each time we hear another woman's story of challenge or we read another horrendous article about what's happening in schools with children or to women in the public sphere remember that we have this really strong proud tradition of winning of making a difference so speak out when you can do what you can and don't doubt that that email to your MP, to your representative can make a difference because it can. And when we all come together, we really can change the course of history. And we're part of that now. We're now going to go on to a, a sort of a different section of this webinar. We're going to have Anne and Alice. They're from China and they're going to be talking about the real situation of Chinese women, the development of political lesbianism among Chinese feminists and lesbian feminists' understanding of political lesbianism. Hi everyone, I'm Anne. I'm from China. I'm talking about political lesbianism in China. Firstly, I want to introduce current situation for Chinese women. Unbalanced is crucial. Chinese have a boy-baby preference tradition for a long time. China counted the population of men and women. There were 30 million women less than men. An official report shows that when people have the fifth baby or above, the sex ratio is very extreme. In Beijing, the sex ratio for fifth baby is 50,000, which means 50,000 boys born, while only 100 girls born. The so unbalanced sex ratio leads to increasing criminal rates. The reason why they think women are inferior to men is they assume women will marry to men and have a baby that follows their father's last name. The last name has very important meaning in China. It represents family and inheritance. Three children policy. In August, China has released three children policy to encourage fertility. However, it is a bad news for me. Some companies start to stop recruiting women because they think women will put more time on giving birth and raising babies, which make women less competitive than men. Besides, three children policy will let more women lose their inheritance rights. 
When a girl is the only child in her family, she could financially support from her family. But when she has a brother, her inheritance right is probably undermined or deprived. Some girls even lose their access to higher education because they need to work and contribute her money to her brother. Heterosexual marriage culture. Heterosexual marriage culture is deep rooted in China. There was a word to describe women over 30 years old and haven't get marriage to men, left over women. Women are expected to get marriage with men by their parents and society. Recent years, China increased the difficulty for women who want to divorce. In 2021, the divorce coming period policy has released. It means if women want to divorce, she had to wait for 30 days. And once her husband refused to divorce, her application for divorce would be rejected. A woman in Hubei died from domestic violence in divorce coming period. China thinks heterosexual marriage is the basis of family and that every family is a part of society. So maintaining society of stability, they should put focus on the stability of family, which means heterosexual marriage. The ghost marriage, I will talk it later. Origin of Chinese political lesbianism. I'd like to talk about how the discussions over political lesbianism broke out in China. For fear of constant harassment and abuse from men, Chinese radical feminists find it very dangerous to hold face-to-face -face events. So we can only conduct our discussions online. Before hearing of political lesbianism, we have supported South Korea's 6B40 radical feminist movement that encourages women to reject sexual intercourse with men, as well as have a baby, dating, sex, and marriage. The ideology is associated with separatist feminism and political lesbianism, which advocates women organizing for their rights by refusing any participation with men and patriarchal institutions. Furthermore, most of us have been passionate Yuri lovers. Yuri is focusing on intimate relationships between female characters. Our enthusiasm for Yuri sparked, our, sparked off our first debate over lesbianism. Most Chinese feminists claim that lesbianism is not relevant to feminism. They object to any kind of romantic or sexual relationship, including lesbian relationship. They think, it is a mirror image of heterosexual relationship. We lesbian feminists have always been fighting against those prejudices and argue that feminists should promote lesbian relationships and protect lesbian rights. Such kind of debates reached multiple rounds and some of us got kicked out of radical feminism groups because of our views. Lesbian feminists had no choice but to start build our own online community. Our understanding on political lesbianism. Within our community, we came to know political lesbianism, which is similar to our beliefs. We translated several Sheila Jeffries' essays on political lesbianism. In the famous booklet, Love Your Enemy, Sheila and other lesbians define a political lesbian as a woman identified woman who does not fuck with men. Many people misunderstand the definition, claiming that political lesbians are heterosexual or bisexual women who don't sleep with men. But we think we should put focus on the phrase, women identified women. The women identified women define herself without reference to male dominated societal structures. She gained her sense of identity, not from the men she related to, but from her internal sense of self and from ideals of nurturing, community, and cooperation that she defined as female. The love, sexuality, and energy of the women identified women were focused on herself and other women, rather than on men or male institutions. In a society that despised and belittled women, many lesbian feminists feel that loving oneself and the other women uh, was the most radical act. We think Political lesbianism is only attracted to women. Sex attraction for women exists. 
But political lesbianism is more than sex attraction. The most important thing is to concentrate our love, sexuality, energy, politics, support on women, and recognize lesbianism is a resistance to patriarchy. We love the motto, feminism is a theory, lesbianism is a practice. Heterosexuality is social constructed. We think heterosexuality is socially constructed and only exists in human being. That so-called heterosexual behaviors in other species are sexual reproduction. Many female animals are raped by males, and that has nothing to do with attraction. Chinese lesbian feminists consider penetrative sex as a type of rape and believe that in order to control and exploit women, men invented heterosexuality, which makes a woman with a misconception that being attracted by men is her biology destiny. If men are our oppressors, why is it natural to fall in love with a member of the class who have been dominating us for thousands of years? Chinese women cannot escape from heterosexuality even after death. In traditional Chinese culture, it is shameful to be the parents of an unwed daughter and unmarried daughters are often shunned from society. There was an interview in China. A journalist asked a group of little girls what they will do after 20 years. Some say they will become a housewife. Some say they will marry a man and have a baby. Do these young girls really know what sexual attraction is? In some regions in China, after an unmarried woman dies, her family will sell her corpse to another family with a deceased son and perform a ghost marriage from born to die. Women are living under the shadow of heterosexuality. As we mentioned, the sex ratio is very unbalanced in China because of some preference they assume their daughters are heterosexual women. Thus, they think we will serve for men and lose our last name. So they think only boys are family members. They want a boy baby, not a daughter. Our sisters lost their life because compulsory heterosexuality, because we are assumed to be heterosexual and have no choice but to serve for men. If some women who want to lift from heterosexual marriage the divorce coming policy prevents them. If some women who want to keep celibate, she would be ashamed by society. Even some women die, they couldn't escape from compulsory heterosexuality after death. Every woman can be a lesbian. We love the song from Alice Dobkin. Every woman can be a lesbian. We think this is a core of political lesbianism. In our opinion, we think every woman will be a lesbian if there is no compulsory heterosexuality. We do think women can be attracted to women and only attracted to women from emotionally and sexually. If patriarchy can assume every woman is heterosexual, lesbianism is a deviation from normal. Why we cannot assume every woman can be a lesbian? Women love women. Women are only attracted to women. It's very natural thing. We think in an ideal society, words of women and lesbian can, de- can be interchangeable. Heterosexuality is social constructed and serve for patriarchy. If patriarchy can construct it, we can also deconstruct it. We believe a woman can deconstruct her heterosexuality and love women. Some people may think political lesbianism is similar to conversion therapy. We don't think so. The commercial therapy is rooted in compulsory heterosexuality and misogyny. They don't want to see lesbians because we don't care about men and serve for men. They are afraid of women become lesbians. They are afraid that women realize that heterosexuality is not innate and abandon it forever and love women. Patriarchy support commercial therapy, but they will never support political lesbianism. They may accept lesbians to some extent, but they also assume only a little amount of lesbians exist. Well, I guess won't need some. Most of women are heterosexual, and this is innate and can never be changed. Huh? For us Chinese lesbian feminists, some of us realize we are lesbians before we get in touch with feminism 
and political lesbianism. Some fans they are lesbians after they get in touch with feminism, feminism and political lesbianism. All of us find that when we know feminism, we love women more than ever before. Some think they were heterosexual women before, although at that time, they didn't feel any attraction to men. After getting in touch with feminism, their love and attraction to women are waking up. They love and only love women. When a woman believes that she is heterosexual, at most times, she doesn't need any condition to check it. Lesbians are survivors from compulsory heterosexuality. Political lesbianism analyzes heterosexuality and points out compulsory heterosexuality. This is very helpful to re resist patriarchy. Every woman can be a lesbian. This is a strong resistance to patriarchy. Furthermore, we think that sexual arousal mechanism is different from women and men. Some women may not feel that she are attracted to one woman at first glance. She may need some time to communicate with each other, become friends first, and then become couples. This is very different from men. Heterosexual male sexuality towards women includes much violence, and we think penetration as rape. But women's sexuality towards women is very different. Lesbians are different from heterosexual men and also different from gay men. Different culture between West and the China. China before Western nation was another society that segregated men from women. Historical Chinese culture has not recognized a concept of sexual orientation or a framework to divide people based on their same sex or opposite sex attractions. Although there was a significant culture surrounding homosexual men, there was none for women. Outside women's duties to bear sons to their husbands, women are perceived as having no sexuality at all. That's one of the reasons why we believe heterosexuality concept is constructed and created to maintain the oppression on women. In fact, in the history of China, sometimes they think men loving men is no bell. Some Chinese men emperors had men lovers, but at the same time, they think women are inferior to men and only have the duties to give a boy baby to men. They never promote women loving women. The concept of heterosexuality is from the West and assume that most women are heterosexual, which makes women believe that they serve for men because they are attracted to men. Without the concept of heterosexuality, the situation of women under oppression is very obvious. No love, no attractiveness, only oppression. Practice of Chinese political lesbianism. First, build our own community. We have built our online community one year ago. Although one discussion group was banned in April with other 10 groups, which also promoting 6B40, that social media banned us for they think the thought is too radical, but we soon rebuild one. Build and promote lesbian culture. We don't only promote Yuri, including lesbian movies, lesbian novels, lesbian comics, but also some of us start to write lesbian stories. Some of us draw lesbian pictures. We want to build our own lesbian culture. From online to offline, some of us, they find girlfriends in our community and they live together. Some of us, they invite their girlfriend to attend to our discussion group. We cherish our sisterhood and we want to deepen our relationship with each other and help each other in real life. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Alice to talk about our political lesbianism discussions in China. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Anne has just given a wonderful description of political lesbianism in China. It's so proud that we can speak at a panel with so many sisters from all over the world and the admirable forerunner of political lesbianism, Sheila Jeffries, present. Uh, my name is Alice, and I really want to talk about how Chinese lesbian feminists integrate political lesbianism into our discussions. It's worth noting that since the beginning, Chinese lesbian feminists have been very clear about the exclusion of men from our conversations, and a gay man is no exception. Unlike the West, China doesn't have a history of gay rights movement. And in the case of gay rights advocacy in China, it's always only gay men who take the spotlight. So as a result, 
It's easier for Chinese lesbians to dissociate themselves from gay men after they learn about feminist separatism. On top of that, gay men in China are notorious for entering into marriage with unwitting women for the purpose of having an offspring, specifically sons. Having suffered from not only being cheated on and emotionally abused, but also having their dignity jeopardized, Tongxi, the wives of gay men, are unfortunately publicly neglected. Much worse, they are unwittingly at high risk for AIDS infection, which stigmatizes them and results in health inequity. Aware of those women's misery, coupled with the fact that Chinese gay men are seeking out overseas surrogates if their budget permits, Chinese radical feminists assert explicitly that gay men and feminists are not in the same boat. This is a so overwhelming consensus that never have I encountered a Chinese lesbian feminist who thinks gay men are the ally. Yes, we don't believe there is such a thing as male allies. We hold our feminist discussions on the basis that women and men are two opposing camps, and that radical feminism is a war between the two sexes. Chinese radical feminists have no qualms about demonstrating their antipathy against men. This leads to my next point, that is, Chinese lesbian feminists no longer uh, not only encourage straight women to abandon their heterosexuality, but they're forthright in speaking out against women who hold on to their heterosexuality. From the perspective of Chinese political lesbians, a, wonderful, a, a woman maintaining her heterosexuality means she still feels attachments to men. Based on the consensus that feminists should erase men from their lives, which is the 6B40 principles and Anne has discussed, Chinese lesbian feminists have made a step further by asking why radical feminists cannot eradicate men from their minds. Essentially, before discovering political lesbianism, Chinese lesbian feminists have already developed similar ideas of abandoning heterosexuality. It's fascinating to see that the arguments of some Chinese lesbian feminists coincide with the ideas of political lesbianism from the West. In my experience, I feel comparing with Western feminists, Chinese lesbian feminists take a more welcome attitude towards a woman who's considering the possibility of herself becoming a lesbian. This open-mindedness is in part because the notion that sexuality is innate is not perceived as politically correct or indubitable as it is in the West. In fact, most misrepresentations and disapprobation of political lesbianism on the Chinese internet come from heterosexual women. The most prevalent counterargument we confront against political lesbianism is a lesbian couple building up a committed relationship will alienate other sisters and that a romantic relationship is intrinsically inferior to a friendship. Not to mention that lesbian feminists put friendships on the same scale as romantic and sexual relationships. Our critics are viewing lesbianism through the lens of heterosexuality. That is, if radical feminism regards having a romantic or sexual relationship with a man as bad, that is establishing a romantic or sexual relationship with women is equally detrimental. Our retort is simple. Women and men are different. So comparing a lesbian relationship to a heterosexual relationship lacks a basic understanding of radical feminism. On the contrary, lesbians are the foremost exponents of political lesbianism in China. Because political lesbians are the only group that accentuates lesbian rights in our feminist discussions, while plenty of feminists see the rights of lesbians have nothing to do with the rights of women. Please know that not all Chinese lesbian feminists believe that sexuality is a choice. Some of us think women are born to love women. Namely, all women are innate lesbians. Their rationale is, if there were no men in the world, no woman would be heterosexual, and every woman would only be attracted to women. Other lesbian feminists accept that sexuality is a choice. Regardless of our different explanations of heterosexuality, most Chinese lesbian feminists agree that any woman can be a lesbian, 
and that political lesbianism can foster a community that offers support and solidarity to women. Here, I'd like to elucidate, elucidate our understanding of political lesbianism, because I've seen many women misconstrue political lesbianism as a heterosexual woman who hates men so much that she takes on lesbian as a self-label. This is contradictory to our viewpoint. A political lesbian is a real lesbian, meaning that she's exclusively attracted to other women. We know political lesbianism is a sensitive topic in feminist discussions, and the misconception around political lesbian certainly contributes to the denigration. Regarding the argument that lesbianism as a choice is lesbophobic, we first want to highlight that no conclusive scientific research has proven that biology determines sexual orientation. The entire search for biological basis for homosexuality is predicated upon the assumption that homosexuality is not the natural or default state of a developing human, and that something must have gone wrong inside lesbian bodies and brains. Furthermore, if people are concerned that homophobes will want to urge lesbians to be straight if there is no biological basis for sexuality, is it not equally true that finding the so-called lesbian genes might also inspire the same homophobes to find a genetic cure for lesbians? What matters is people's agenda when talking about their ideologies. Political lesbianism never wants to cure homosexuality. Lesbophobia is entrenched in misogyny and heteronormativity, both of which les Chinese lesbian feminists are aiming to challenge. In our opinion, political lesbianism is the exact opposite of lesbophobia as it champions lesbianism. Rather than blaming political lesbianism for aggravating lesbophobia, we'd better reflect on the concealed and omnipresent fear of women no longer choosing men. Right now, we are happy to see that many Chinese feminists are reconsidering their sexuality after coming to know political lesbianism, and that many lesbian feminists are advocating political lesbianism to other lesbian sisters.